So we got up to the first stanza, stanza, I was saying stanza, being from Rhode Island, of the first chapter, the chapter on the refutation of production. We were reading the second chapter, the refutation of coming and going. Going and coming. And that's why I sent you the, uh, I sent you Buddha Pavita's refutation of Buddha Pavita's commentary on this stanza, his whole commentary on, the, on this stanza, and included um, in this section on the sources is R, uh, Baba Viveka's response to Buddha Pavita's commentary on this stanza, his negative commentary to Buddha Pavita's commentary, and also, I'm just, yes, and also Avalokitavrata's um, spelling out of, of Bhava Viveka's meaning, which is very long and very helpful. I was about to say is tedious. It's not tedious if you're reading it. It's tedious if you're translating it. Um, but it just took patience on my part. Um, and for some reason I had the patience uh, because, because I knew how helpful it, it, it is. Um, Bhava Veka is very terse, um, uh, whereas Buddha Pavita is much like Chandrakirti, um, it's relatively easy to understand what he's saying, where he's coming from, and whereas Bhava Viveka is well I want to say somewhat imperious uh, as if you should understand him and it's your problem if you don't <laughs> and Um, uh, of Devrata's commentary um, takes apart everything and it's, it's really very, very beautiful that way. Um, um, Haribhadra's commentary on I'm just getting up from my nap uh, <laughs> I'll make that my excuse uh, I won't claim it's your problem <laughs> um, <laughs> excuse me what did you say it's our problem. It never hurts to blame somebody else. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, it's a constant joke here. I'm, I'm always blaming somebody else. 
as a joke. <laughs> um, he, um, Hari Bhattar's commentary on Maitreya's ornament for the clear realizations. He has one of his commentaries. One of his commentaries is like this. It takes apart every little thing. And uh, it's great, great for students. Uh, and I, I've mentioned it before, uh, Richard Robinson, who was my mentor at the University of Wisconsin up until his death, um, reached back at his desk when he was giving, uh, choosing what to give me for my Sanskrit prelim. Uh, he just reached back. He didn't look. And he just reached to his Sanskrit shelf and, <laughs> and with his hand picked out something which happened to be that type of commentary from Haribhadra. And uh, uh, fortunately, I was used to that type of commentary. I don't know from what, um, from my work in Tibetan. Uh, not not, uh, not Haribhadras and, and not on Maitreya's ornament for the clear realizations. But I tuned in to the type of commentary immediately, or more or less immediately. And um, when I gave him my translation and he looked it over, he said he was surprised at how much I had done, how well I, I had done. I. So I was more than pleased. I'm showing off, in case you didn't notice. <laughs> um, he didn't bother correcting anything. He just, which was a, I don't know, it was sort of like saying, well, at this level, we don't bother, I don't bother correcting. That's what he was saying. I'm sure there was there was plenty to correct. But in other words, it was pass fail. <laughs> it wasn't pass fail, but he could have bothered to correct. So anyway, not for himself, which in Tibetan is Dakle Mayin. So, uh, even though it's Dakle Mayin, this is not a Mayin Ga. Mayin Ga is, a non is an affirming negative, is the Tibetan word for affirming negative. It, it is a non-affirming negative. So, this is an excellent example. Um, not, is not from itself. Or, I mean, if one translated the Tibetan directly, it would be, is not from self. Is not from self. And that is not from self is not and is not negative. It, well, uh, is not a copulative negative. Copulative, copulation, it occurred to me the other day after so many decades. Copulative, is, copulation is, you know, it's obvious, it's so obvious. Uh, two people joining. Uh, so, uh, uh, is, as we were saying last time, has two meanings. One is copulative. It just joins two things. Uh, Richard Robinson is my professor. Richard Robinson is my professor. 
is doesn't tell you anything about existence. It just says it's just joining Richard Robinson and my professor. Richard Robinson is fat. So in the first case, is my professor was joining Richard Robinson and professor, joining two nouns, associating two nouns, joining, thus using the word copulative. Uh, the, the, the copulative is. These fancy words have very common meanings. Um, ex existential, uh, Richard Robinson does not exist. He died uh, while I was in graduate school. So if I went to graduate school in 1968, he must have died in 1970. Um, so Richard Robinson is not that we some we say that sometimes. So that's an e existential and. Um, some people say Trump is an existential threat. That existential, uh, I, I used to not like the word existential because it, it wasn't a term I used much at all, but that's being used a lot nowadays. He's an existential threat to the world. The climate, you know, because of climate, not recognizing climate change and taking us out of the Paris Agreement, etc., and not organizing, you know, blah blah blah. So the, that word has come to have more play. So, so is as an existential term, and is as just joining a noun with a noun or a noun with an adjective. I don't have a simpler uh, word other than copulative. Is as a, the copulative is. Do you, do you have a Adjectival, uh, but the, there's noun. You see, there's a noun version. And a, adjectival or noun version, yes? In a second, book, he used the reference copulative, but he used the word more like associating, like associating qualities. Yeah. Yeah. Joining. The joining is. It's certainly not a common. Uh, they call it statements of qualities instead of copulative associations. Is a, is professor a quality? Feels a little weird. Yeah. yeah. Problem with fancy words is uh, they just turn people off. For instance, Hopkins translations. They <laughs> 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 because even words like negative, you know, emptiness is a negative. It's like as if as if that's very fancy. <laughs> and then non-affirming negative. What the hell does that mean? Even if non-affirming non isn't very complicated, it requires an explanation. Uh, anyway, okay. Um, so if we translated the full Tibetan, uh, is not from self, is not from others, is not from both, is not causelessly. The problem why one wouldn't do it that way is that 
the Sanskrit is na. I put the Sanskrit first here. I don't like putting the first the Sanskrit first, even though temporarily, time wise, Sanskrit was first. You know, it was first in Sanskrit and then translated into Tibetan. Because I'm working in Tibetan. And so I like to put Tibetan first. As Leon Hurwitz, who was at the University of British Columbia, UBC, when I taught here, uh, and, and he was still here when he died, um, said, well, you're, you're working in Tibetan. We were riding in the car. And I made up, uh, I'm sort of embarrassed by it later, made up a phony excuse, like, I'm sorry, I, I put Tibetan first. And he said, well, you're, you're working from Tibetan. That's, <laughs> uh, he and I were, um, well, what he said of me, which was very endearing, he said, well, you're somebody who knows both the words and the meaning. You know, he was older. And I thought, wow, this guy is not showing off in front of me. He's, <laughs> you know, it's, you know, we were good friends. We became good friends. But anyway, na, na swatas. Swato is, uh, if you look in the, the translation from the Sanskrit, na swato is, uh, uh, you, is a euphonic that means to make it more pleasant to read uh, it, the, the word really is swatas which is an adverbial <laughs> to use uh, ablative N not from self swa is self and uh, tas makes it ablative, meaning from self. And, and there's no uh, is. There's no is. <laughs> there's no is. But the is was added in Tibetan. So I'm explaining why I would not add to the Sanskrit is not from self even though the Tibetan has, is not from self. But, but the meaning stays completely the same, yes? Yes, the meaning stays completely, yes, absolutely. So is not from self, is not from others. And it would be fine to do that. Uh, so not from self, so swa, self, and the T-A-S, which euphonically, euphonically means making it sound nice, uh, goes, tus goes to toe. And then na upi becomes napi, na upi changes to napi. These are the rules of, of uh, joining na'api becomes na'pi. Para means other. And you see the same ending of tas becomes to in the Sanskrit. Not from para. Just like uh, 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 par paramita. It's very interesting. My stuttering comes out when I switch from one language to another. Paramita, other, gone beyond. You see, to the other, to the other shore. Shore. Um, not from other, and then na, which you know now, if you didn't know before. Na means not. Uh, dua, dua means both. And uh, dua, 
Ab, is it Abhyam or Bhyam? I forget. I don't know whether it's Dwa or Dwa. But anyway, Abhyam or Bhyam is the dual ending for from. Not from both. Na api. Na api, the Y is a euphonic change. Euphonic change because the api, api means also. Na api. The I changes to Y in Sanskrit because it's next to the A uh of Ahetu, Ahetu. Uh, <laughs> so, A uh, is a negative. Hetu means cause. Hetu means cause. So, Ahetu uh, means causeless. And the Taha, the, there's a, another, the Tas, you see, T A S. So, Swatas at the in the second word, tas, swatas, paratas, paratas, and then the dual doesn't use tas, it uses byam or abhyam, I forget. And then the hetu tas at the end, you don't have a, you, don't, you wouldn't have an s at the end. Tas changes to ta, ta. Not, well, ta, hetutas. So, a uh, hetutas means cause less. Na swato, na pi parato, na dwa, na, na dwa biam, na pia hetuta. So Dakle Mayan Dakle Mayan Shen Lemin Yile Mayan Kumemin. So it takes two lines in Tibetan. So the Sanskrit has two half lines. It, it that I'm not making that up. Sanskrit has two half lines, which in Tibetan becomes two lines. So these are four the the uh, English says, non-affirming negatives. There are four reasons, not from self, not from others. There are four reasons. And what do these four prove? You see, there are four non-affirming negatives that prove something. Even though they're non-affirming negatives, they affirm something. They affirm something of similar type. Another non-affirming negative, no production. No inherently existent production. No inherently existent production itself proves something, affirms something, which is no inherent existence of things. No inherent existence of things proves, proves, I guess so, implies uh, no inherent existence of non-things. So a non-affirming negative can prove a non-affirming negative of similar type not some other, you know, um, um, non-connected, non non-affirming negative, unconnected, non-affirming negative, like uh, no, no matter how similar uncompounded space is, and no, no matter how much uncompounded space serves as, a, as an analog 
of the emptiness of inherent existence. Uh, these four, or the emptiness of inherent existence, does not imply the absence. Well, I'm I'm just digging a hole for myself <laughs> because I just said it'll it'll prove or imply the uh, absence of inherent existence of uncompounded things. So. <laughs> Uh, uncompounded space, the ab emptiness of uncompounded space, it would imply that. <laughs> uh, it's pretty funny. I dug a hole for myself. So I have a copulative Mayan with Dakle Mayan in Tibetan, which isn't an affirming negative. And something like the Buddha Amitayas, which in Tibetan is Tseba Me, Me, is not a non affirming negative, which the, the name for non affirming negative in Tibetan is Me Ga, so, uh, which would be an existential negative. Uh, the name for existential negative, even though tseba me has an existential w word in it, me, it's not. Tseba me is not an existential negative, even though it has this existential word in it. It, it rather is an affirming negative. And even though I wanted to say last time that I wanted to twist Amitayas, the ah uh of Amitayas. I in Sanskrit would ah uh be an existential negative? Wow. Uh. The shortest uh perfection of wisdom sutra is ah, uh, just the word ah. Uh. So that would be, that syllable of would be an existential negative. Last time you were, you were using the word space when you did that. Yeah. Which is a, a line over it, not this word. Yeah. Then that's akasha. Akasha, which does not have any, any negative word in it. Yeah, we were settling that. That the ah kasha is not a, that ah is not a negative. Ah is not a ah. An ah. Wow. Mm. Is it time to stop? <laughs> That's a lot. Mm. So now we'll read Buddha Palita's commentary. This will be a chance for us to take a look at Buddha Palita's commentary, which is really cool. I had a lot of fun going over it. As you may remember, I'm involved in writing producing seven volumes on not from self, just these three. This controversy. And I'm in the process of completing the sixth volume. Um, and I sent you the first volume. So that means five of the volumes are complete on the website. And I'll expect you to have read the first five by next week. 
And by the way, uh, those questions which Boris uh, raised several weeks ago are best answered by the fifth volume. The Tsongaba's great exposition of the stages of, you know, the great exposition of special insight are the fourth and fifth volumes. But I recommend you to read the fifth to get your questions answered. You and Venerable were raising questions. And I would dive into the fifth. Um, and your questions revolve, for the most part, around how can you say that these syllogisms that the consequentialists use are other renowned, renowned to others, if you consequentialists yourselves approve of all of the elements of those syllogisms? How can you say that the elements of those syllogisms are merely renowned to others? Tsongaba dives into all of those questions. You will see that he himself says, hey, what's going on? How can you say that you consequentialists accept the subject, the predicate, the reason, and the examples? Um, you know, what's going on? Well, are you a liar? You know, you know, what's the meaning of the name? Other renowned. In what sense are these syllogisms other renowned? If you accept all the parts of the syllogism, um, you know, in, in the same with regard to the consequences. You know, he himself asks himself all these uh, questions. And in other words, the turn to the second of the two volumes that are detailing Tsongkhapa's views. And to repeat, what I've said before, Tsongkhapa's opinions become more or less crystal clear because rather than just Tsongkhapa's text, uh, those two volumes have Giant Sheba's outline and he doesn't have much commentary except for his outline that announces what's going on, what's coming next, what's coming in this paragraph, which is great to have. Here's what's coming. And then, so that's Gomam. And then from Sarache, there's Jati Geshe Rinchen Troop fills in with more words, Tsongkhapa's sentences. And so, and that's in, Jain Sheba's in yellow type, in yellow highlight, and Jati Geshe Rinchen Troop's uh, additions are in blue highlight, blue highlight. And why I recommend turning to the second volume is that the first volume can wear you out with the not so relevant material. Just wear you out. Um, whereas the second volume uh, just, you, you know, you say, yeah, that's just what I want to know. And um, so that's volume five. And what I'm working on is of volume six, 
which is Tsongaba's um, different approach to the same topic in his The Essence of Eloquence, which is very brief. And uh, I'm translating, well, I just finished. Jigme uh, Tamsha Gyatso, who flourished mainly in the first 50 years of the 20th century in Amdo, his commentary. Uh, but it's so brief. Um, on that, you know, what you want are the fourth and fifth volumes. And again, I say, within that, the fifth volume. Which is what's in Lumrin, in which people break their backs over to understand. But with John Sheva's outline in yellow and Dati Geshe Rinchen Troop's additions filling out of the sentences. Um, it's much easier to read. And then if you turn, you know, whatever you want to read after that, whether it's the New Jersey translation or Geshe Serba's uh, exposition, it just, you know, rings with, I'll say, more clarity. And, and even you say, oh, well, this is easy to understand. say that what you're writing here does that this next part that we're coming up to that explains the what you see as not whether some people are saying that a pot is a negative and you say no a pot is a positive that thing I think is so well explained with the debate and the commentary that you put there because it's been very hard to understand what the heck is really going on and it's crystal clear what you have there Maybe I maybe have to read it five times. Yeah. Once you get there, I mean, what you write there is so clear on that. It's really, I, I've been, you know, confused. And I felt like that was really... Good. Like, well, it's nice really to nice. hear. I, Frankly, I find it that way when I read it. And it's not as if it's my work. It's... You know, it's um, John Sheba's prime student, oh, what's his name, uh, who did the debates. Right, yeah. And he's building out of what Songbu wrote. Uh, no one Joshi. No one Joshi. Right. So here we are, and we'll. Oh, I want to stop now. It's 45 minutes. So we'll. we'll See how cleverly you see I sent this to you this morning. It's really one, it's not one week. It's even more clever because we won't be meeting next week. Okay, so I'll see you in two weeks. Okay, good. Bye.